Sometime in the, I think the 1880s, my great grandfather ordered a kit from uh, Montgomery Wars. And what was the kit? It was a grandmother clock. And that clock, even while I'm upstairs, I can hear it ticking. And every hour and half hour, it gongs. And it still runs beautifully as long as I remember to wind it. Tick tock, tick tock. You know, time is passing, isn't it? Life is passing. At least it feels that way to the pendulum moving back and forth, the, the shift in action, an atomic clock, time, change. It's said that when something is changeless, it's timeless. The atomic clock, I think it's got, it can divide a second into six, 17 millionth or billionths of a second. And the second itself is based on now on a cesium atom and the way it transitions itself. It's amazing. And yet, when you think about it, you know, the, that cesium atom, if the gravity is heavier or if you're moving, it, it decays differently. Time passes differently. And we know that now. It's called time dilation. Fl time seems to flow at different rates, at different gravities, at different movement speeds. They say that the, the inside of a record is aging quicker than the outside of a record because the outside, or maybe it's the opposite because the outside's experiencing more gravity. So time, time. And it's said that the movement of time is only can go one way and that's forward. Even physics, is saying time can go only one way, and yet it is also addressing time moving, or particles moving backwards uh, in time at the subatomic level. And time is also called the fourth dimension. And all of these things are true of time, and we can get lost in thinking about them. But today's idea, the point of discussion, is really that this theory called the block universe theory, where... All time exists simultaneously, and we're just passing through. Even Einstein at one point said, time is an illusion. In this block universe theory, everything is there. It's already there. Time isn't passing. We're passing through space-time. The present is, is basically uh, our location within the block universe. The past is a slice of the universe at an earlier location. The future is a later location. So past, present, and future are locations within a singularity that is already done. There's a beginning, middle, and end. It's a done deal. You can hold it, and it's there. And we're inside of it, passing through it. Therefore, we have to think, is time an elaborate mind trick? And maybe it is. But it also poses that, does that make time travel possible? And within this theory, actually time travel is possible, but the time machine itself is already part of the block so that you really can't change anything as any change would already be part of the whole. Whatever it is, is already there, is already here, is already whenever, wherever. However, does this make the universe a predetermined, locked-in place where there's, there's no ability to, to move, that you're just you know, following your, your destiny, and not even destiny, but a dogmatic sense of, of uh, Cartesian, you know, you're just one billiard ball? No, because even the block universe theory has evolved by saying that the block itself is evolving. It's dynamic. It's not static. So even though we can change things, we can't change anything. You see, this is where the paradox kisses its ass. And it's a really wonderful place at the deep end because <laughs> it, it's confounding. It's confounding. You know, it, it, it 
It relates to our previous podcast on the eternal now. It relates to the mystic's dream of one whole reality that we're part of. It relates to, uh, do we really live in a matrix? Uh, uh, so the point of discussion today is about this block universe, all time existing simultaneously. Time's not passing. We're passing through. And we can touch it, and we can affect it and be affected by it. And yet, in all the, the differences and the, the, the iterations, it's all already part of it. Now, that's a, a, a query to me. And I like the theory because it allows for a lot of the physics of um, quantum physics and quantum tunneling and all that to, to take place in some interesting ways. But I'm going to just turn it over. Um, I've thrown this out. And uh, Bob Hayes is from Florida, a lifelong friend. Marianne Ruddis is from Spokane Valley. My name is Red Hawk, and I'm coming from Spokane, Washington. And Bob, I'm going to throw it to you. I just threw out a whole lot. What's your response, reaction, um, roll your eyes or whatever? <laughs> Well, you know, it's it, it, there's so many different theories out there. You you've thrown out the the block theory of time. There's also the the multiple universe theories of time, and there's there's a a lot of different uh, things that physicists toss around and bounce off each other, and none of them seem to be able to get a hold of it uh, and, and figure out which one <clears throat> is the more probable. But uh, I've always found it uh, fascinating to look at how we perceive time, because you've got you've mentioned that you know movement, the speed, gravity, and so forth changes the passage of time, but our mental state, our degree of attention, our uh, uh, what is occurring at, at this moment of now <clears throat> also changes how we perceive time. We perceive it moving faster or moving slower, uh, depending on a lot of different factors. And uh, one of them being age. As we get older, time seems to pass faster. And uh, so it, it, it's just a fascinating subject because it's all around us. We, we know things change. The sun comes up and the sun sets and another day goes by and another week goes by. So we can see that, that something is changing. We were, we're passing through time. But during this passage, we're also changing the way we perceive time. And uh, one of the, the premier researchers who, who studied this, these effects was Robert Ornstein. And it's, it's, he was also one of the, the premier researchers in split brain studies. And it's interesting if you look at his biography, you look at his, how he passed through his lifetime, the longer he studied time, the more he became, he became closer to being a mystic. And toward the end of his life, you, you could almost take a quote from him and put it next to a quote from Baba G or Baba Ram Das or any of the the uh, great mystic philosophers that we've talked about in various various uh, right. different episodes. And so how does it, I want you to bring it back to the block universe because that's our idea of discussion. And I know there's all these other aspects that we can get into, but I really want to see us because that's that allows for multiple universes. That allows for, uh, you know, when you see the time as a fourth dimension and that it can be encapsulated. So I'm trying to keep our discussion not getting too far out in terms of our perceptual because we've done that in previous uh, uh, episodes on time. Okay. <laughs> well, and um, I, I, you know, we... we, we I'm trying I'm not to. Sure what I, I'm not sure what I can say about this about the block universe, other than it's there and and it's a, it's a theory, and I, I don't know a lot about it myself. So I'll step back and let Marianne pick up on it. All right, Marianne. Well, yeah, because I know everything about this topic. Oh, right? it's it's new to me too. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm I'm. That's why I want to entertain it. 
<laughs> yes. Well, you know, I have been um, reading a lot about um, kind of, I, 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 there are a couple of things that, that were mentioned already. So if time is, we mark time by change. And if something is changeless, then we say it's timeless, correct? And if everything is happening, every, what was that, that movie that was just out? Everything, everywhere, all at once. And so if that's kind of the, this idea um, that everything is happening simultaneously, then it takes me to that place of what are, how do we, I, I always go back to the practical applications. So how do we spend our time? What, Bob, you mentioned lifetime in this lifetime. And so we have a specified lifetime. And the fact that it's happening all at what I, I it, it's hard to wrap your brain around that because oh, yeah. <laughs> our, you know, we're we're living here in this linear place and as we get older, I agree that it, time does appear to move faster. Is that because we're going through more changes as we age? Is it because we are starting to be able to perceive um, things differently? It, it's, I don't know, it's all kind of mind-boggling, and yet um, it, it comes back to... Do we have any choices? Are we are we affecting our lives? Are we affecting this universe? If everything is happening all at once, are all the ripple effects that happen from every little choice or every decision we make, they've already created those ripples. They're, it's all happening at the same time. And I remember as a child being taught that... Um, Everything that ever happened will is is already known. It's already done, and so then it it would always come back to well, if that's true, then why am I doing anything at all? Because I could go and sit on a beach right now with a mai tai or a, a drink in my hand, and everything that ever was going to happen is already happening. So why participate in anything? Because that part, and, and I know I'm going around in circles here because this is just, it's just mind boggling. So I have to come back to that. Yeah, maybe there is, maybe everything is happening all at once, but there has to be some entry point for our individual consciousness to be able to affect our lives, our 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 thoughts, our direction, our actions. Yeah, um, and, and you put your finger on, on the main point, and to me, of this model. Uh, one, this model facilitates so many things in physics and astronomy and, and, and all of those things, but how can we change everything? Is, again, everything just predetermined? And this, if you go on in this model and you study it, you see that the model itself is a dynamic happening so that we can affect it, yet we can't really change it. In other words, we can't change the outcome. We can't, and, and that's where it gets mind-boggling to me. Now, I'm going to step back a second and say, in terms of our perception of time, there have been great studies. I got to, you know, Ornstein's is one uh, on perception of time. But there are also, I think a guy named Ellis is working on this. You know, the older you get, they, the... Time going faster as you get older is a study that's that's been everywhere. Uh, and one, if time is relative, that means when you're two minutes old, a minute is half your life. As we get older, a minute becomes smaller and smaller. That's one theory. Another theory on the perception of time is that, as, that time and a perception of it is based on how much you're learning and taking in new information. And as we get older, we're taking in less and less new information and relying on previous information. That's another theory. So if people want to go into that more, uh, ask the question and, and Google it. Uh, it's a it's a you know, as an old guy, and things are moving pretty damn fast. Uh, uh, it, it's a question that entertain that that uh, draws my interest. However, 
This block universe thing, although I've heard of it, it's new to me, and that's why I wanted to entertain the thoughts of it. And Marianne, I thought you, again, laid your, your finger on, if, if, you know, it gets back to free will, can we affect it? Uh, and, and see, there's a, there's a mystery here of how we can change things and yet never change anything at all. Uh, and I don't, you know, our last podcast, we really determined that the brain is fixed in time. It's, it's a click, 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 click thing. It's got this neurological side. And so to be the left brain, well, yeah. Uh, and so maybe the right brain is able to take this whole cube or sphere or whatever it is that holds all of time and is this dynamic happening within itself. Uh, maybe it can poetically touch it. Maybe it's a way, you know, I think uh, mathematics is, is able to explain things in ways that I don't understand because I can't do the math, but I can catch a little piece of it. Um, am I making sense here? Because, and you know, I have to say, this is part of my journey of what's the new piece. Well, you know, the, the distinction between left and, and right brain is, again, one of perception. Because the, the right brain is still operating on the same principles as the left brain. You've got neurons that are firing at certain rates and so forth. But there are specialized areas that are, are used to enable us to perceive things in different ways. And, uh, you know, th this idea that, that, that the now is a spatio-temporal location and the future is a different location, I, I can kind of resonate with that. I, it, it makes some sense to me. But again, it's even so, it's our perception of it. it and, and it also has, has to do with attention. The more we attend to something, the slower time seems to go. There's a great scene in the Beatles' Yellow Submarine movie where yeah. they talk about a minute being a long time, and they demonstrate it. Every second they change the screen and have another something going on. And by the end of that minute, it seems like it's gone on for an hour. Because so many things have happened. And I, I don't know how we separate this idea of spatial location from our perception of that spatial location, spatial, spatial temporal location, from our perception of it. And that gets back down to the, you know, the origin of consciousness and what's it all mean and that kind of stuff. And, and it, it, you know, we always seem to be curling back to the same questions, you know. Well, and we and have free, but is there is there something? So we're we're in this big, you know. The you, everyone's probably seen these these two dimensional drawings that are trying to depict gravity and and so forth. And you have you have dips where where gravity is stronger and 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 so forth. And and how you move through that and time changes because you're speeding up and the gravity is is changing it. But still, that's only a very, very crude approximation of four dimensions in two dimensions. And although it, it seems like we're getting a handle on it, we, we're really, it, it just, to me at, at least, it, it becomes even more and more confusing yeah. the deeper we go into it. Yeah, and it's important to see that science, philosophy, religion, and the arts have different views of time. And again, the deep end is to try to... Uh, Look at those processes and things that life can't do without. And life is a time-oriented thing, and consciousness is now reaching beyond the bounds of its own um, abilities, almost. And that's part of what this, this, why I wanted to entertain and discuss this thought, because one, it facilitates so many other things. Multiverses, uh, I mean, uh, basically, uh, you know, I used to have a picture of a of a of a mystic, literally juggling different time time reference. You know, how, how do we how do we begin to see time differently? And we're going to go into in over the next uh, uh, couple podcasts 
of what the road to enlightenment is about. And the road to enlightenment, I'll tell you right now, is made out of one thing, learning to see past the way you're seeing things now. And that, that that's what we're trying to do at the deep end. I'm trying to find new ways for me to understand my own life. The same thing that caused Da Vinci to try to see the proportion of life. Remember that guy who's all spread out? Uh, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, that he, he was looking at the proportion of the human being to the universe. And what was that? And how do you, how do you measure that? We're still doing that at the nano <laughs> level. Uh, and, and the nuances are getting more subtle and more subtle. And I think that's part of what's happening in the politics. The nuances have gotten so subtle, people can't handle it and they want to go back to primary colors. Uh, and it, the world doesn't work that way anymore. Um, so um, it, it's, it's uh, over and over uh, a way to look at the universe in new ways. Stand by. Wow, what a discussion. Uh, and you know, I have to say these issues and ideas come out of my spiritual journey and what is driving me a little bit crazy in the incomprehensible division of my own brain. Uh, and time has always been an interesting thing. Uh, uh, Robin Williams used to call it the theory of relative. That's when you have relatives, the longer they stay, the slower time goes. Uh, and it's, you know, it's the whole way of perception, uh, the way neurology works, the way size works, the way uh, gravity works, all of these things come together into this amazing event called life being consciousness, self-awareness. And I can't imagine living my life, and this is my dharma, uh, without looking at these things up close and going, uh, I gotta hit the, the 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 explicit button, but what the fuck? What the, you know? What is really going on here? Is there any way to uh, address it with the mind, and or is there any way to align yourself with it? so that your deepest connections are allowed and your deepest being is allowed to express itself. I think those are part of my journey and why this time thing, because I refuse to believe in the predetermination stuff. I really believe we can affect the universe and, you know, um, I don't use the word God much, but if you look at my definition of God is the intent and impetus of the universe that we are the growing edge of the universe that represents consciously the intent and impetus. We can look at what's happening with us, with a flower, with every animal. It's the same, you know, life wants more of itself. That's what Eros was all about, life wanting more of itself. And here we are still wanting more of itself, trying to somehow, I, I, I shy away from the word figure it out, but to engage it at deeper levels of nuance and understanding that can facilitate the processes that bring forth goodness and wholeness and health. Now, having said all that uh, and trying to place my own um, crazy journey within context, um, we're at the place of final comments. So, Marianne, final comments for you? Well, I think what, what strikes me um, about just this whole idea of time is how when we're trying to perceive it and, and understand it, that our imagination is what is critical to... Um, to be, being able to even engage in any kind of conversation like this because we are imagining, we are um, entertaining possibilities, we are entertaining things that we don't completely understand, but we are trying to put it into some kind of, at least I am, I'm trying to put it into some kind of a, a useful 
backdrop for me to be able to live my life. And, you know, we talked about this last week where perception is participation. So maybe that's what, that's the effect that we have on, on time. Maybe it is all happening, everything, everywhere, all at once. And maybe it is um, all already laid out. But as we perceive it, we're participating with it. And, and maybe that's that change. That's where our individual minute time on this planet, our minute time in these bodies, maybe that's what it, that's what it's all about. That's our contribution. We come here, we've got whatever brain we have, and we perceive things. And, and then things kind of ripple out from there. And, um, um, but I think too, the, the other, the, the one other thing that I wanted to talk about was aging and the, and the perception of time as we age. We know people who are 85 years old that are living a life of old, being old and, and not engaging. And we also know people that are 85 years old who are engaged and are, are vibrant. And, and so is that because they see the world differently? Is it more of a physical thing? How much of our perception creates the kind of um, life that we, we live? I don't know. So. Amen. Amen. Bob, final comments? Uh, well, just one quick thing. Uh, I think that there's an interesting thing that's been happening basically during our lifetimes, and that is people are more aware of time. There are more references to it. I mean, you just look at the popular science yeah. fiction of all of these multiverses and, and time travel and moving back and forth in time and so forth. And it's really only a few hundred years uh, what was H.G. Wells wrote the time machine back in the, the, the late 19th century. And people, you know, people didn't start making clocks until a, a certain, you know, probably a thousand years ago or so it was sand and, and, and so forth. So as, as we're moving forward and gaining more insight into, into the universe, the, the, our, our feelings about time, the questions we ask about time, get much broader and much deeper, and uh, uh, throw that into the the idea that one of the ideas of reincarnation is that our different lives are all happening at once from a, a, a higher perspective, and we're all you know each life we're learning a piece of, of a larger story, and you throw that in with time and all of these other things, and you go wow you know. Let's just get on with it, you know, and uh, I, I do agree with Marianne, you know, be, the, be whatever it may, we've still got to deal with the practicality and, and move through the time as we are perceiving it and as we're living it and uh, doing that the best we can. Amen. Well, and you know, the Hindus got it great. Uh, they, they realized early in their tradition that it was all an illusion and it took a, another thousand years before they realized the illusion was the only game in town and they had to live within it. And what the hell did that mean? And that's where the sutras come. That's where Mahabharata comes. That's where Bhagavad Gita comes. Is how do you live in the world with all this craziness? And I want us to say that whatever time is, it's crazier than we can imagine. And I think we all touched on this. Our brains are rigged to see certain things, and yet our brains are also evolving in such a way as to see a little bit differently, to put the world to, to, to differently. I read a thesis on how our founding fathers understood uh, uh, a woman getting pregnant, and I can't remember what it was, but it w was laughable. Uh, and we've come a long way in understanding who we are, what we are, and how it works. The piece that's hard to me is talking about it. And that's why I really thank, thank you two and for letting me kind of guide the conversation based on my own fanatical dharma, if you will. Um, but it feels more and more as I get older, it feels like... <laughs> 
like although time I'm, time is passing I'm passing through it it feels like that and my awareness of that and it causes it triggers in me certain understandings uh, that are new and that's what this block universe was it's I've heard of it before all time exists simultaneously I got that but I didn't quite understand some of the the deterministic aspects of it I didn't understand how change that can't change anything uh, which I still don't understand however I'm, I'm convinced that it's true because of what's changed in me and how that changes all the time and I have to ask and this is where we're going to our next podcast what is it that makes us human I mean we have self-awareness and I remember in anthropology they the first thing they thought of was we're, we have tools that's what makes us and it was like well chimpanzees have tools and it wasn't until we started seeing the graves where people were buried with broken arms that had been healed with with their weapons and with food that we began to see something makes us human that has to do with awareness. We're going to entertain that thought in our next podcast. Until then, blessings, my friends. Blessings.